Hi, welcome back. If I'm asked what I do for a living, my response is I'm a teacher. I'm not an academic, it sounds so abstract. I'm not a professor, that sounds pompous. I'm a teacher first and foremost. And it's the time of the year where I get most excited because I get ready to teach my classes in the spring. Now, for those who have been reading this blog for a while, you know that every semester when I teach my classes, I invite people to join in. I don't do this because I'm a Mother Teresa and I want to share my knowledge. I do it because I'm, I'm selfish. I want people to attend my class. If I'm going to prepare for a class, I want thousands of people to listen, not just tens or hundreds. And while I cannot offer you credit for taking these classes, well, the good news is they're free. There is a version of the class that I will talk about, of, of each of my classes that I will talk about, which is an NYU certificate class. If you take the class, you take exams, you will get a certificate, but there's a price you will pay. Not to me, but to NYU. So if you don't like the price, you can complain about it, but I have no power over it. So let me set the process in motion. I teach in only one semester every year. It's a good life. And I teach three classes, and I'll be teaching three classes in the spring of 2020. One will be a corporate finance class for MBAs, that's for the first year MBAs, and the other two will be evaluation classes, one to the second year MBAs and one to undergraduates. Incidentally, they're exactly the same class. Now the classes, the MBA classes will kick off on February 3rd, 2020, and go all the way through May 11th. There's a spring break between March 15th and 22nd, but there'll be 26 sessions of 80 minutes apiece. The undergraduate classes would start a week earlier, no, uh, on January 27th, and go through May 11th as well. There'll be 28 sessions of 75 minutes apiece. Now, there are three ways you can take these classes. The first is, you can almost sit in on my regular classes every week. Well, not quite. You can't just walk into NYU. The security will not let you get it. But every one of my regular classes will be recorded and will be available for watching later in the day. So if I teach a class between 10.30 and 11.50 and 11 on Monday, that class should be available to be watched by 2 or 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And that's going to be true for all three classes. The session videos will be accessible from my website as a stream. They'll also be available on YouTube and on iTunes. There are multiple ways you can watch, <coughs> watch these lectures. You can take the class in, in, in real time. So each week you can watch the two lectures I will give that week and keep up with the class over the 15 weeks. But for many people, that's too much to ask. So this class would stay online for a couple of years. If you want to stretch it out and watch the classes in bunches, you're welcome to do that as well. So that's one option is to take my regular classes, 80 minutes a piece for the MBA classes, 75 minutes a piece for the undergraduate classes. Now I've been offering these online classes for a while and I've discovered two things. One is lots of people start my regular classes with the best of intentions. They're going to finish the class with everybody else and do it in 15 weeks and a large percentage drop off for a couple of reasons. One is Watching an 80-minute session on an iPad, a tablet, or a computer is much more difficult than actually sitting in a, in a seat or a bench and watching the same class live. Second, 80 minutes twice a week is a lot of time commitment. And for lots of people, life gets in the way. People get sick, they have jobs. So it's difficult to complete the regular version. So about four or five years ago, I created an online version of each of my classes. And here's what I did in the online version. I took each 80 minute class <clears throat> and made it a 12 minute class. Luckily, we pad our classes a lot in MBA programs. It wasn't that difficult to do. So there's an online version of each of the classes that I teach that you can take. And that online version is available both on my website and on iTunes U, as well as on YouTube. And the online versions are, the one thing is they're dated. I did them in 2015. They're not as updated as, as my regular classes, but they're more palatable. They're in smaller butts. There's a third choice. And this is for those of you who want a certificate. Now, all too often in the last 20 years when people have taken my classes and they've been able to finish the class, they come to me at the end of the class with a legitimate question. Why can't you give me a certificate? And I tell them the truth. I said, look, I don't have the power to grant certificates because at least in New York State, you need to get permission from the state and I have no desire to go down that path. Second, it's a lot of work. You've got to get exams and quizzes online. You've got to record them. And I'm not sure that I can do it. The kind of, uh, I don't have the bandwidth to do that. And third, I'm 
pretty lazy. I don't want to add this to my to-do list. Now you're saying, why don't you offer your class through somebody like Coursera? And um, unfortunately, the, these online platforms like Coursera work with universities. They don't work with individual faculty. And NYU has no agreement with any of them. So about four years ago, when NYU came to me and asked me whether they could do a certificate version of my classes, I said yes on one condition. I said, I will do it as long as you let me keep the free online version. And once I said yes, I created certificate versions of the classes. So the certificate versions, I'll be quite honest, you're getting pretty much the same content you would get on the online class that I just described. But there are four add-ons. First is you will have to take quizzes and exams along the way and you'll be graded and recorded. Second, every two, you know, every person in the class has to do a real world project, just like somebody in my regular class. My corporate finance class, the project will be a corporate finance project. My valuation class, we'll pick a company and value it, and I'll grade that project. Third is every two weeks in these classes, we have a Zoom or a WebEx session where we meet as a group. It's, it's not as good as meeting in, in, in person, but it's, you know, you can ask me questions about valuation, about your project, about the material, about life in general. I'm not that good with life in general. And finally, at the end of the class, assuming you make it through these hurdles and I don't make these classes slam dunk. So I have no desire to pass out certificates just because you sat through 15 weeks. I want to be able to tell other people, hey, this person's taken the class. He or she can do valuation. You get a certificate. And in fact, if you do particularly well, you can get a certificate with honors in the class. So you have the regular class, 80 minutes, uh, you know, twice a week or 75 minutes, the undergraduate version for 15 weeks. You have the online class, which is about the same classes in 12 minute bites and a certificate class, which is the online class with the add ons that allow you to get a certificate. Let's talk about the classes themselves. I teach three classes. Two I teach as regular classes. One is a class I have the material for that I've never been able to teach at Stern because I've never had a slot to teach it in. The first class is the corporate finance class. And I said, in terms of sequencing, I would take corporate finance first. Second class is a valuation class. And the third is an investment philosophies class. Very quickly, here's what they do. The corporate finance class lays out the first financial principles that govern how you run a business. It's about running businesses from setting objectives, to what projects do you take, to how do you fund the business, to how much you return to stockholders. The valuation class is all about valuation of what just about anything from Bitcoin to a baseball team to a stock to a business. I want to talk about how to value pretty much any asset, no matter what perspective you take. And third, the investment philosophies class is about how should we invest. And I'm going to argue that there's no one right way to invest. It depends on who you are as a person and what makes you tick. So finding the investment philosophy that's right for you. So let's start with corporate finance. As I said, corporate finance is the ultimate big picture class. It's about how to run a business. And I often say, look, I can describe this whole class in one page. And this is the page I start the class with, and it becomes the structure I use all through to tie the class together. It starts by laying out what the end game is. What's your objective? If you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter how you get there. So I'm going to talk about what the objective is in corporate finance. And this has already become part of political debate. Forget about business debate, because traditional corporate finance has been built around the premise of maximizing stockholder wealth. And recently, if you've been reading the news, there's been talk about stakeholder wealth and customer satisfaction. I'm going to talk about why we pick the objective we do and how that objective feeds into the three big decisions that every business has to make. First is the investment decision. Where do you allocate scarce resources? We're going to talk about how to come up with a hurdle rate, what you need to make for an investment to pass muster, and how you measure returns on investment. We're going to talk about the financing decision. How much debt and equity do you use as a business? What's the right mix for you? We'll look at the trade-off, as well as what's the right kind of debt for your company, long-term or short-term, dollar or euro, picking the currency, picking the maturity, picking the special features you put into debt. Finally, the dividend decision, we look at how much cash companies should return. And indirectly, we're also going to ask the question, how much cash is too much cash? So when you see a company like Google with 120 billion in cash, is that too much cash? You might say the answer is obvious. It's not that obvious. So we're going to talk about the investment decision, the financing and the dividend decision. And that's my corporate finance class. It's an applied corporate finance class. You say, what the heck does that even mean? 
I actually take everything I do in the class and pass it through a very simple test. Can I apply it? If I can't apply it, I'm not going to talk about it. It's not a theory class. And I use six real companies as my lab, lab experiments that run through the class. And here are the six. I talk about Disney, a company that everybody kind of understands, a company that's changing, facing fresh challenges. I take it through the entire corporate finance process. I, the second company uses Vale, a Brazilian mining company, very different from Disney, emerging market, natural resource company. I take it through the whole process. Third company I, value, I, I use is Starter Motors, part of a family group companies, more the rule than the exception in Asia and Latin America. How does a family group company navigate the shoals of corporate finance? We'll take it through the entire process. Then I look at Baidu, a technology company and a Chinese company. How do technology companies you know, face the challenges of corporate finance, take it through the process? And look at Deutsche Bank, a disaster now as a bank, but a, but a regulated entity and how, how corporate finance decisions are both more constrained and more difficult in an entity like a bank. And I finish with a small independent bookstore in New York City, a privately owned bookstore, to talk about how small private businesses face the same challenges, often on a much larger scale because their mistakes can be incredibly consequential, it can be disastrous. So I talk about that company all the way through the process. And as I do this analysis of my six companies, every person in my class has to pick a company of their choice and take that company through this process as well. It's an applied corporate finance class. Who's the class directed at? I am biased, but I think everybody needs to have a corporate finance perspective from CEOs to founders to VCs to strategists to even politicians. So I believe everybody should take, should have at least those corporate finance principles. I don't believe they need a class to get it. I think some some of the very best business people in the world have come in with, with those principles already ingrained. I've taught this class to a to very diverse group. I've taught it to CEOs, I've taught to banking analysts, I've taught it to VCs, to startup founders. I taught, used to teach this class to high school students in New York City. I've taught it to senior citizens as a special class and um, that I used to, you know, the, that I that I offered. Essentially, I you know, not everybody gets the same things out of the class. They take away very different lessons and, and aspects of the class depending on where they come from and where they're going. So if you are a 21 year old undergraduate taking the class, what you might take out of the class are the tools and the techniques that you can use on your job. But if you're a CEO or a strategist, what you take out of, the, uh, out of this class will be very different, a big picture perspective that allows you to ask the right questions. So, you know, I welcome all of you to come to the class, take what you find useful, abandon what you don't, but I think you will be enriched by having a corporate finance perspective. So if you're interested in taking the class, again, let me relist the choices. You can take my Spring 2020 Corporate Finance MBA class, which starts on February 3rd. You can go to the web page for the class. It'll describe all the resources of the class right there. You can, the second link is my website, which offers a streaming. So each class you'd see, if you go to that link, you'd see each class show up with the streaming links, with the materials that go with each class. There'll be a YouTube playlist where I'll, as, as links add on the attachments for the slides, the post-class tests, etc. And finally, there's an iTunes U version of this class where if you have an iTunes U app on your tablet or your phone, it doesn't have to be an Apple device, incidentally. You can download the iTunes U app and, and use the enroll code to actually join in the class. So that's my spring 2020 regular class. If you find that too daunting, to too much work to do, go to the online corporate finance class and it's a much shorter version. As I said, it's dated because it's from five years ago, but it pretty much has the same material. You can get it again from our website, from YouTube and iTunes U. And the certificate class link is there. And remember again, if you go to the certificate class, you will be charged, it's not free, but you will get a certificate from NYU for taking the class. So that's the corporate finance class. The valuation class, I, I, I try very hard not to make it a one-dimensional class where people talk about one model from one perspective. This is not a class for just equity research analysts or bankers or appraisers. This is a class about valuation for everybody. So I talk about different ways of thinking about putting a number to an asset, intrinsic value, pricing, and even real options. I talk about bringing different perspectives on value. How does a acquire a value business? How does a passive investor value business? How does a manager see value? 
I look at uh, value from the, from the perspective of restructuring, changing value. And also I'll talk about valuing all kinds of companies, young companies, old companies, developed companies, emerging market companies, not companies, as to project, pretty much everything. So my end game here is you should be value, able to value just about any asset. And I do make a big deal about the contrast between value and price. Value, as, we, as you saw, comes from cash flows, growth and risk. And often we use discounted cash flow models to estimate it. Price comes from demand and supply. While cash flows, growth and risk affect demand and supply, it's also affected by mood and momentum and all those behavioral factors we've uncovered in finance. To value an asset, you've got to forecast cash flows and perhaps do a discounted cash flow valuation to price an asset. You got to find other assets like it and see what other people are paying for similar assets. What causes changes in value are changes in cash flows, growth and risk. What causes changes in price it could be shifts in mood and momentum. The investment philosophy you take when you adopt a value approach is you think you value something and the price is different. You buy something with the price is less than the value then you hope and pray the price moves to value. If you take a pricing philosophy, you buy at a low price, you sell at a high price, you might not even care about value. And the key ingredient for success in each is also different. Value is having the skills to value something and the faith to hold on or act on that value. In pricing, it's being able to detect shifts in mood and momentum and get out in time. So I think it's important that we understand first the contrast between value and price because 90% of what passes for valuation out there, banking and M&A and in equity research is really pricing, masquerading as value. Fair value accounting is fair price accounting. This class I talk about the contrast. Who is this class directed at? I hope to keep this class general. I want it to be useful to a business owner, to a VC, to a founder, to a consultant, investor, an appraiser, a CFA, to pretty much everybody. I don't teach this class at for, for people who want to build spreadsheets. I teach this class to people who want to understand valuation. I want you to be able to value just about any asset, not take yourself too seriously as you do it. Because I think the problem in valuation is we made a very simple concept into, into a complex one. Often because that's how we as appraisers, people in valuation make a living. Finally, your choices, you can either take the MBA class or the undergraduate classes. I said they're identical. Don't overkill, don't take both. It's torture. Again, you can take it either through my web, web page or the web page for the class that's on my website. You can take it on YouTube or you can take an iTunes U. If you feel the classes are too daunting, try the online valuation class. If you want a certificate, it's an NYU certificate class. So those are my two regular classes. Let me talk a little bit about investment philosophy. This is a class I've never taught, but I've always had the material to teach. And the origins of the class came from two observations. The first was, if you look at the pantheon of successful investors, they range the spectrum. You got old time value investors, the Warren Buffetts, Ben Grahams of the world. You got growth investors, Peter Lynch. You got uh, VCs who succeed, the Mark Cubans, Macro and Market Diamonds, George Soros. You got quant players, you got qualitative players. I mean, you got a very diverse group. That's the first thing. So there's no one, one theme that connects all of them. The second is, there are millions of people who follow these successful investors, read every book about Warren Buffett, follow every pathway he's taken, and they have nothing to show for it. So I've tried to reconcile these two facts, and that's led me to conclude that there's no one pathway to success in investing, that there's no one great investment philosophy, that there are lots of different investment philosophies. But what determines whether that philosophy will work for you is whether you fit that philosophy. Put differently, for you to be a successful investor, the person you've got to understand is not Warren Buffett or Peter Lynch, it's you. The key to investing is ripping away those delusions we have as individuals and being honest with ourselves. So I talk about every conceivable investment philosophy in the class, even though I have my favorite philosophy. So I'm going to tell you what mine is, but I'm going to try to be as open as I can about the choices, ranging from you know, and I divide the different philosophies based on which part of the portfolio management process they come in. If you think about the portfolio management process, there are three steps to it. There's asset allocation. You decide how much of your money you put into stocks and bonds and tables and cash and real assets and different geographies. There's the stock selection part where you decide which stocks and which bonds and which piece of real estate. There's the execution phase where you decide how you're going to acquire these investments to hold in your portfolio. 
and different philosophies are built around different parts of the, of the portfolio process. If you're a market timer, your focus is on the asset allocation part and you might decide that you can, you, you can, decide, you can time markets. You can tell which market's going to go up and allocate more money to that market. You can time markets based on either micro or, or, or fundamental variables. So you've got analysts who use market-wide PE ratios and CAPE and Schiller PEs to decide if markets are overpriced or underpriced. You also have macro market timers who think the key to timing markets is to get economic cycles right or get the yield curve. So you have the market timers. Their focus is on getting asset allocation you know, to work there. Then you've got the security selection part and it's a very crowded space. You've got those people who believe that markets don't incorporate the information in past prices and trading volume and use charts and technical indicators to pick stocks. You've got value investors, you know, passive value investors who think that if you can buy stocks that trade at low PEs or low price to book or high dividend yields, you found cheap stocks. You've got Contrarian value investors who believe that if you can find stocks that have been beaten up a lot and you're going to be able to make money because they've been beaten up too much. You've got activist value investors who think the key to success here is to find badly managed, badly run firms and then acquire them and try to push for change in the firm. And finally, you've got growth investors who think the key to investing here is to find stocks that either have really high growth or growth at a low price. You know. In fact, you can argue that venture capitalists are activist growth investors, buying companies that are young growth companies and then kind of fixing them and exiting by selling to somebody else. Finally, the execution phase, you've got two investment philosophies. One of the arbitragers who look for pricing bargains where the same stock is priced differently in two different markets and they try to lock in their profits. The essence of arbitrage is you take no risk, you put no money and you walk away with profits. It's like a money machine. You're looking for mispriced securities. Another aspect of the execution phase is you look for information and how it gets incorporated into markets. Maybe markets are not good at dealing with earnings reports and you try to then exploit that, that inefficiency by trading around information. So we're going to look at the whole range of investment philosophies and along the way perhaps you will find a philosophy that's right for you. I don't teach this class for portfolio managers or analysts, I teach it for investors. And my intent is not to tell you easy ways to make money or how what the right philosophy is because I really don't know the answers to both. I can, I'm not going to offer you advice but I'm going to give you a menu and I'm going to give you the information so you can pick the philosophy that's right for you. It's a much more qualitative class than my valuation and my corporate finance class but I hope you enjoy it. Finally in terms of choices there's no regular class but you can take the class either as an online class and it is available on my website on YouTube and iTunes U, or as a certificate class. The certificate class is not quite ready to go yet. I'm, I've just finished recording the videos. I'm going to do a trial version in the spring and then in the fall I'll, it'll probably be offered as a certificate class. So those are my choices and I hope something in there you know, fits your fancy. So finally, just as a closing thought, you know, as, as somebody grew up in India, I'm very familiar with the guru sushya relationship in teaching, where the guru is this all-knowing individual who imparts his fountain of wisdom and to a very receptive and usually very subservient follower. I don't buy into that notion. I, you know, I, you know, I, I firmly believe that every person who walks into my class, no matter how much of a novice he or she thinks he is, and, now he or she is in finance, already knows everything I'm going to say in corporate finance and valuation investment philosophy. My job is to make them aware that they already know and give them a structure where they can take what they, what they already know and put it into neat slots and perhaps the tools to take their knowledge and apply it. I'm just a guide and not a very good one at that. Now, I, I, I hope that you know, some of you get the chance to sit in my class and no, I, I hope you get something out of class. And along the way, I hope I don't bore you too much. Thank you very much for listening to this session.